Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about this because this was needed for your um, your row vibrational lab, but also anytime you have a uncertainty in several measurements, right? Say you do a titration and you do two three titrations, so you have an average and a standard deviation, but you may not be actually calculating, may not be actually measuring the thing you want to know. You may have to take that value and then manipulate it some, and you may have to incorporate two values that both have uncertainty. So what's the uncertainty in the result? Right, you have to be able to answer this question. And I will tell you that when I was uh, taking this training on statistical improvement of process control and industry, being able to propagate uncertainty was like a ninja Jedi skill. Like so few people understood it. And so if you can understand this, you will definitely rise in terms of the food chain in your workplace because you'll understand how errors and, and uncertainty figures into your process. You have all these inputs that all have uncertainty and they all figure in to your process. And if you can calculate and follow those through, then you can make wise decisions. You can find the piece, the input variable that's killing your output variable. You don't want to have to go analyze everything. You want to find the thing that's really hurting you and fix that. So this is the nature of random errors. If you've got this true value and then it gets bumped and changed, you have all these different fluctuations in nature, eventually you get this nice normal distribution curve, the Gaussian function. And so with all of these statistical results are essentially based on that normal distribution. If you have a different distribution, then you may have to change some of these results. But, but for, our for our purposes, we can just assume normal distribution of uncertainties. So let's go through some terms. The sample is if you have uh, less than 15 measurements. Now, how many peaks did y'all measure? How many peaks did you pick in the row vibrational spectrum? Yeah, close to 50 to 54, right? So at least, so a lot. So you have way more measurements than just 14. Each one of those peak pick values was a measurement. Okay, and that figured into your regression analysis. So you have a sample, or a you have a population. You have more than 14 measurements in your carbon monoxide uh, lab analysis. Uh, we show the mean in different ways. We'll put it in those uh, um, angle brackets, or we'll use a bar over the top to indicate the mean. For a population, the mean is used to uh, the Greek character mu. And then we have the standard deviation. You're probably familiar with these formulas, but let's just walk through this formula. Instead of just memorizing a formula, uh, think about it for a little bit. Read it like a paragraph. And so what we have is we have the mean, and each individual data point is indicated by xi. So this xi value minus the mean, that is a deviation from the mean. And we go through every data point. So we look at every data point and see how it deviates from the mean. Now some are going to be positive and some are going to be negative. And so if we were to sum those together, they would cancel each other out. So we square them so that they're all positive. So we take each individual deviation, we square each of those, and then we add them up. We get this huge number. It's very similar to that root mean squared value, right? If we were to just take the square root of that, that would be that RMS value. But if we divide by the number of data points, then we get the average deviation. It's the square of that average deviation. And if we take the square root, we get back down to the level of the data that was collected. So we square them, sum them, divide by the number of data points, and then we take the square root. And so it's like, a, it's like a, an average deviation. We call it the standard deviation so that we don't confuse people with using average twice. We have the average and we have the standard deviation. Now we talk about this at n minus 1 when we have a small number of data points less than 15, because we've removed one degree of freedom by taking the average. So we need two data points at least to, to calculate the average. Uh, and then we need a third, essentially, to get a good standard deviation. Now, if we have a population, that, in, that minus one is essentially irrelevant. And so we can, we can simplify it a little bit. Now this, this value tells us the uncertainty because if the deviations are large, then our uncertainty is large. If the deviations are small, we're very certain about that value. And so then we use some of these other terms. The spread in the data is max minus min. And we have these relative standard deviations. So if we take the standard deviation and we divide by the mean, 
we're saying it's relative to the mean. How big is it relative to the mean? So that's the RSD. So the uncertainty divided by the mean value is the RSD. Now you could just as well write sigma over mu. Okay, so those are interchangeable. And then we have this coefficient of variation. It's this relative standard deviation times 100%. Now what if your deviations are really, really small? Like they are in the, in the carbon monoxide lab. So if you get a RSD that's 0 0.00004 or something, it doesn't really do you any good to put that in percentage terms. Let me just show you what, what you can do. So if, R, if uh, sigma or S is equal to point zero 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 four. Let's see. Let me turn this on. Let's do this. So if this is your relative standard deviation and CB is equal to RSD times 100%, then you just get 0.004%. It still doesn't really, I mean, it's still a tiny number. I mean, that's putting in percent doesn't really botch you much. But a lot of times we put these things in different units so that it's a nice whole number or something close to that. So what if we looked at that and we said, well, what if I looked at parts per million, right? So that's be a thousand. We could go three more decimal places. So instead of multiplying by 100%, what if I did RSD times 10 to the 6 ppm? So this is 10 to the 2 per percent. It's the same calculation. This is 10 to the 6 ppm. Then I get 40 ppm. So that would be my uncertainty in parts per million. Yeah, so the relative uncertainty in parts per million. So it says that 40 parts per million of my average is uncertain. That's pretty good. Okay, so it doesn't have to be percent, but most commonly the, um, the CV is written in percent. So let's talk about uh, confidence limits. So we want to determine what the most reliable value is, the true value of this, this measurement. And, and so we put limits around our mean. So we can take our uncertainty and we can just use that, plus or minus our uncertainty. But that really only captures 62% of that Gaussian distribution. We might want to capture 95% of that distribution. And we'll see an example of that in a minute. So we would put those limits, our mean plus or minus some values, and that those, those limits are meant to say I'm 95% confident the true value is somewhere in the middle. Okay. If we just report the standard deviation, it's good practice to pre present in. And so in your reports, you should say our, you know, on our uncertainties and so on, we, we, we collected the, the peak information from 54 peaks. Okay, so to let somebody know, I didn't just calculate this from two peaks. I didn't just take R10 and subtract R9 and to find B. That would be a, that would be a result. You could get a bond link from that, but you wouldn't have any statistical information. You would just have one measurement of B. You, could, you don't even, can't even take the average in that case. Um, RSD and CB are useful, but then let's talk about the significant figure conviction, convention. What we do in, in terms of reporting significant figures is we report all certain digits and one or two. I've seen both in practice, but not three or more. Okay, three is right out, as Money Puffin would say. So one uncertain digit, sometimes two. And so we use the standard deviation to identify the certain digits. This is different than what you learn in freshman chemistry. Okay, the standard deviation is what tells you where the certain digits are. Or if you're doing confidence limits, you might, you might have to add another, you know, like might have to move the, the, the certain digit back a little bit. So let's look at these examples. So for the significant figure convention, the calculator or Excel gives you this long number, 
42.67221452. You know that not all those digits are, are, are reasonable, right? You're not going to keep all of those. Okay. And your standard deviation, either from the ANOVA table or from your calculation on your calculator, gets 0 0.06349, so on, so on. Okay. So what are the certain digits? How do I know 42.6 are certain? Because my uncertainty begins in the next decimal place. Okay, so the uncertain digits start there, 722. Two. So this, this should lock it down for you now. You look at your value and you look at the uncertainty and the uncertainty tells you where uncertainty begins. And that's how you know where to round. Okay, because where do you round those numbers? You round them with one or two uncertain digits. And so you would report either this, that the distance is 42.67 meters or 42.672. And your standard deviation, if you were reporting it with that, you would put 0 0.06 with the first value. Or if you were going to keep two uncertain digits, you would report 0 0.063 with that value. Notice what, ha what has to happen is these two have to match. So if you keep one uncertain digit, then the place value must match. If you keep two, the place value still matches. Notice this one goes to two decimal places, this one goes to three, and so don't get those mixed up. Don't report two decimal places in your, in your mean and one decimal place in your uncertainty. Okay. I see some wrinkled brows. Ask me questions. Okay. So the decimal place values of these must match. Do you understand what I mean by place value? Tenths hundreds, thousands, those are place values. And so if your standard deviation is reported to hundredths, like it is right here, then the, the mean value must be reported to hundredths. So those have to match. This doesn't have anything to do with, with our rounding in our freshman chemistry class, because there you didn't have any averages or standard deviations, okay? There you had a single measurement. And you would just assume that the uncertainty was plus or minus one in the last digit. But that was an assumption. Now we don't have to assume. We measured the uncertainty. So we don't have to assume that it's plus or minus one in the last digit. We've actually measured it and it's plus or minus six in the last digit. <laughs> okay. Since we have a measurement for our uncertainty, we know it's not just one. It's six in that last digit. Or it's 63 in the last two digits. I don't know why people count two, but they just do. Okay, you see this at NIST, you see this, you know, even in the, the like NIST, the highest standards organization in our country, will sometimes report two digits of uncertainty. So let's, um, so this would be some examples. Again, confidence limits. If you were to take that 0 0.06 and multiply it by 1.95, that, that, or 1.96, that 95% that confidence interval Z, then this is what you get. So the 95% confidence interval, this is how you would record it. Distance is equal to 42.67, and you can put in parentheses plus or minus 0.12 meters, and then you would write at 95% confidence, N equals seven. So let's say we did seven measurements. <coughs> Look at how much information is in that reported line. Yeah. Look at another way of writing that same thing. You could write it this way. 42.67 in parentheses just one, two. So these are the same information reported two different ways. Look at how the one, two is placed right next to the two digits it would replace in terms of place value. So that right there means this up here. Okay. So you can report it this way. Just do it right. <laughs> okay. It just matches that place value. So whatever. And if I just had a if I just had a single number here, then it would just replace the single number to the right. And it would be a plus or minus that place value. Okay, standard deviation. You could write it this way. But you should tell people what it is. You should tell people that it's the standard deviation. Notice that's an S there instead of a 95% confidence. So I'm telling people I'm reporting my standard deviation. I'm not reporting my 95% confidence. 
This is actually 63% confidence, plus or minus S. And I'm giving them the number of data points. You could also write it this way, 42.67 with a 6 in parentheses, same thing. Notice the 6 would replace that place value, plus or minus 0.06. Um, it's next to that number that's in the hundredths place value. And then you could also use RSD or CV. Um, you could say that the distance is 42.67 meters. RSD is 0 0.0014 and equals 7. So this right here is S over M, and this is M, or mu, I should say. This is uh, or S over X bar. So this is your average. This is your relative standard deviation. You would have to do a mathematical calculation to get to S, okay? But you can report it this way. And you could also report it by multiplying that by 100%. So you could say 42.67 meters plus or minus 0.14%. N equals seven. So all of these are valid ways of reporting. Which do you think is the most uh, helpful? It's kind of an opinion, but which do you think? Do you... I like the plus or minus explicitly stated, but it adds length. Okay. In tables, you know, it gets tedious to see the plus or minus, so a lot of times tables use the shortened form. Okay. Tables of values. But as far as this, um, do you like confidence limits, standard deviation, or RSD and CV? Deviation. You like standard deviation? Okay. Others? Yeah. I personally like the 95% confidence. Just because it, it tells me, you know, what those limits are at 95% confidence and whether that's going to hit the literature value or not. So that's why I asked for it in your lab. I would like to see y'all report your 95% confidence values for your bond link for your rotational constant, all those things. Um, and so then you can look at the literature and see, I mean, you're 95% confident that the true value, which isn't exactly the same as the literature value, but the literature value is our accepted value. We don't really know ever the true value, okay? But our accepted value is the literature value. And so you can see if that literature value falls within your 95% confidence limits. And if it does, you did a great job, <laughs> okay? And so it's kind of like a contest. It's like, can I get the, can I get analysis good enough and have, um, you know, really good data and confident enough that I captured my literature value within my 95% confidence? Now I say that you did a good job. Sometimes your 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 precision is so good, okay, that it's very narrow and your literature value is over here, <laughs> okay. And so there was some systematic bias that threw your experiment off. And so then you would try to explore what that bias was. And it wasn't probably, it was not your total mistake. It's possible, but don't throw yourself under the bus so easily. You know, you try to find out in your mind what possibly could have happened to cause your data to slide. Because you've done a pretty good experiment if you've got a nice, tight distribution. You got the same answer multiple times, but something was giving you that same error. So you've got a systematic bias, but you've got a really precise experiment. So. so this confidence level, how do, we, uh, how do we come up with these values? So this, this equation, I noticed somebody brought by a PowerPoint, and it was different in that PowerPoint. It had a, a z sigma over square root of n, and that's incorrect. So just scratch out that square root of n in the denominator if you have that in your notes. So for a population, it's just plus or minus z times sigma. And here's the table for z's, okay? So if we just um, went plus or minus one sigma, actually I said it was 63% confidence, it was only 68%, and it was 60 something. So if we just reported plus or minus one sigma, that would be 68% confidence. Uh, if we go to 1.96, that's 95% confidence. What if we wanted to be 99.99% sure? We'd have to multiply our sigma plus or minus 4, essentially, 3.89. So plus or minus 4 sigma. Yes? So is this a standardized sort? It doesn't matter what molecule? Or yeah, this is statistics, so it doesn't matter even it's just for polling data. You know, everything from, so this is based on that normal distribution curve. Uh, now, if you had a sample, you would need to use T. And so here are the T values. 
and it depends upon how many data points. So let's say we had that, that titration of three titrations, and we wanted we had our average, and we wanted to we calculate our standard deviation. We wanted to give our 95% confidence interval. So we come over here to n equals three, and we want 95% confidence. So we'd have to multiply our standard deviation by three, and then divide by three. So it'd be square root of three. And so that would be how we compute our 95% confidence. Notice if we just had one titration. Oh, we have to multiply, I don't know how we would get our average and standard deviation, but it's 12. For 99, it's 6,366. So this score blows up. So do more data points. Yeah. So these are the equations that you need to use for propagation of uncertainty. This, uh, these top two are the ones you're going to use the most, sums and products. Now you can write these in a little simpler form. Let me just do it on the board. So we can write this in a little bit simpler form. If we, if we squared both sides, we'd end up with, with this equation of sigma y squared is equal to the sum of the squares of all the pieces that go into it. So that's a very simple equation to remember. The, the result, the uncertainty for your result squared is equal to the sums of the squares of the uncertainties of all the things that were added and subtracted. And so that's, that's easy to, to remember. Look at this one. If I took this y value and divided it by, you know, both sides by y, I would end up with y over here. Right? And if I squared it, I would get rid of the square root and then have the square here. And what is this uncertainty divided by the value? That's RSD. So in this case, the equation is just as simple. It's the RSD for y squared is equal to the sum of all the individual RSDs squared. So those are your two most common propagation of uncertainty equations. And you should know all of the pieces that go into these equations from your measurements. So if you have the uncertainty in, oh, well, let's do the one with uh, bond length and, and rotational constant. So we have this long equation. It's got 16.8 or whatever grams per mole uh, angstrom squared wave numbers, right? And then we've got the reduced mass. And the reduced mass has really a, a you know a lot of digits in that, so very little uncertainty in the reduced mass. The main thing in calculating that bond length is the uncertainty in the in the rotational constant. Okay, and so we have this this situation of RSD of y is equal to x times RSD of a. So if we had our, our bond length and our rotational constant, and that x is our exponent, what is the exponent for the rotational constant when we, when we get to, to get us to the bond length? What is that calculation? It's the square root, isn't it? So what is that exponent? It's something to the one-half power, isn't it? So it's that, that rotational constant to the one-half power. So this is the equation we would use to propagate the uncertainty to get to the uncertainty in bond length. So if the uncertainty in our, uh, our rotational constant, let's say it's the relative standard deviation is 5, then the uncertainty, the relative standard deviation in our bond length is 2.5. It's one-half of that relative standard deviation. So that's what you get from these equations. You can't just take the uncertainty in rotational constant and slap it onto your bond length because you're overestimating it by a power of two. It's a, it's a square root dependence. So if the, uh, if the rotational constant varies a lot, but you're taking the square root, the bond length varies a little less. Okay. There's lots of practice um, available on our, web, on our uh, Blackboard page for this. But let's quickly, in two minutes, go through this example. So here's an example where we have two pieces of uh, two inputs. 
we have a metallic object weighing two and a half grams and it displaced, displaced 0.13 mils of water. So what's the density? Well, this is straight from freshman chemistry, mass over volume. So the density is easy to calculate. But the question is, can you tell if it's gold or tungsten? Well, looking at all the numbers on our calculator, we see 19.25, and coincidentally, that's tungsten. So as a freshman, you'd make the mistake. You'd say, it's tungsten. That's what my calculator told me. But where's our uncertainty? So we have two values that go into this, so we have, and they're multiplication division, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a quotient. So we have the relative uncertainty for the mass here and volume. We take the RSD, square them, take the square root, multiply by, this is that Y value here, our density, and we get our uncertainty. And our uncertainty is 7.6 grams per mole. Per mil, sorry. <laughs> Where's our uncertain digit? In the ones place. <clears throat> okay, so this is what we would report if we were just reporting our, our standard deviation. So it's 19.3 plus or minus 7.6. Okay, so this is the normal distribution curve that would have that width of 7.6 grams per mil. It's centered on our 19.23, which is very close to, to tungsten, but I've also put on here the 50% confidence limits. So I could say it's a 50-50 shot that it's tantalum, tungsten, gold, rhenium, platinum, osmium, iridium. Okay, flip a coin. It's either those or it's not. Okay, or if I wanted to be 95% confident, I could say it's, I'm 95% confident it's in this list. That, that sounds <laughs> no, it's statistics. We got a really crappy volume measurement. Okay. And so our conclusion is our instrument stinks. <laughs> right? You cannot say that it's tungsten. You can't say, yeah, but. Okay, there are no yeah, buts. Okay. <laughs> you know, if you don't know the uncertainty, then you're in big trouble. Okay. Um, this is how NASA skips space equals off of Mars. They added the uncertainty in twice on one of their calculations. Yeah. And so then some example, again, we've got some other examples. So that's a, that's a helpful example of a simple calculation using uncertainty propagation.